Philadelphia is steep in broadcast history. From the early pioneering days of broadcasting in the 1920s to today, Philadelphia has always been at the forefront. The Delaware Valley has been home to some of the best local programming in the country, starting with the early soap operas and children's shows to pioneering the best news formats in the country, much of it all began right here. From radio announcers to television personalities, cameramen to directors, these were the broadcasters that burned up the airwaves. These were the pioneers of Philadelphia Broadcasting. All right, let's start start at the beginning. Where where'd you grow up? Grew up in the uh, Germantown section of uh, Philadelphia, about, around Mount Airy and Wissick and Avenue, Mount Airy and Lincoln Drive. Did you go to school? In, uh... I went to Chesnall Academy, PMC Prep, and finished up at Germantown High and okay. Temple. So you're a Philly guy. Yeah. You, well, through Temple? and through. Yeah. Through and through. So how did you get into the broadcasting business? Well, my family was in the broadcasting business. I was always interested in it. And um, when I got out of the reserves, a job opened up at Channel 6, and or 6 ABC as it's known today. And uh, I was very lucky to get in there with a great group of people. Okay, so how did your family get involved, or how was your family involved in broadcasting? Well, my father was in the publishing business, the music publishing business with Frank Sinatra. And uh, my uncle was, uh, my father Lester was in the music publishing business with uh, Frank Sinatra, who owned mm -hmm. a publishing company. And um, my uncle was with uh, the t was with Columbia Records, RCA, Victor, and NBC. I mean, he's he okay. switched jobs, but he was in the right. was in the in the entertainment field. All right. So how does this translate into you getting involved with the uh, broadcasting? Well, always being around different entertainers and going into studios all the time with my father and with my uncle, I got to like it and it was a, something that I enjoyed and thought I could be successful in. So the bug bit you. Yeah. Is what, what really the what happened. The bug got me. So now you, you, you managed to get uh, a job at Channel 6? You're right. I got out of the reserves and uh, started looking around and Went that went to Channel Six or at those days WFIL, right. and um, they offered me a job in the business office, and okay. I took it. All right, and then what happened? Well, then then they needed somebody to censor and go over the films, and at the time, uh, Channel Six was owned by Walter Annenberg, which owned Triangle right. Publications, right. TV Guide, and many other publishing. A publishing empire, mm -hmm. and um, they needed someone to censor the movies for all their TV stations. They own six TV stations throughout the country, mm. so they asked me if I'd be interested in that. And of course, it was sound like a fascinating job watching movies all day. Mm -hmm. And so then I got transferred down there, and then a job opened up on the uh, production crew. Mm -hmm. and um, I wound up with the production staff uh, at WFIL. So let me go back to the censoring of the movies. So right. you sat in a, in a room. I sat in a room. The office happened to be, Channel 6 was at 46 The Market, right. and uh, my office was at around 48th and Lancaster Avenue. It was at a wholesale candy <laughs> place that supplied vending machines. And, so you were and we had a little office, and we watched... And I watched movies all day. So you weren't at the studio then. You you not, were at this not other for that place. period of time. Right. No, I was. So now tell me, did you ever? Uh, what were you looking for? I mean, mostly people, mostly content, um, more stereotyping of people, mm -hmm. and um, the treatment of animals. Part of the NAB code, the National Association of Broadcasters, and of course some uh, uh, scenes that you wouldn't want family and family to see. We were very, um, very critical of mm -hmm. presenting a good product to our uh, viewers and uh, mm -hmm. they were very strict as to what we could, what, what they wanted to go out on the air. So you literally spliced out those scenes? Yes. You yourself? You caught them, right. caught them and glued them. Uh, and if it was really bad, I would send it to some. If it was really bad, the movie, or if I thought it was quite really questionable, then I would send it to Triangle Headquarters, which was at 46th of Market in mm -hmm. those days, 
and there was somebody there that would look at it and tell me whether the, we could show it or not. Did you ever get any kickback from the producers of those movies since never, you were basically... Never. Um, once one movie, uh, a word slipped by. They said, we can't use that word on TV. It wasn't, it wasn't a word that I was used to. Well, I'll tell you the word. The word was bastard. Okay. And, they, and it was the, an English movie with Lawrence Harvey, mm -hmm. and the English used the word bastard like we use how, uh, some yeah. other hell and damn, and uh, they didn't want that on the air. And I, it was a war movie. I let it slip through. Uh -oh. They told me about it. I said, fine, and another bastard never got on the air. Wow. That was the last bastard. That was one. That was one. And uh, the movie of all movies that would be this, I would say, the supreme test for testing censorship would be the movie Looking for Mr. Goodbar, oh. which took me a week to edit. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but now the, today's movies, though, are fairly explicit. Well, today's movies, society has changed, and probably what I would look for today would not be the same things that I would look for, what I looked for in those days. The, the, the stereo, even the stereotyping of people mm -hmm. would be somewhat different. There'd be some things the same, but it would, there would be somewhat, a little mm -hmm. different guidelines. I don't say easier or harder. The, the guideline, I'd be more sensitive to certain things and so, other things that you wouldn't bat an eye at. Yeah. Because, like you said, society's changed. Right. And, and with the advent of cable, which is not restricted, right. uh, Anything the the, the strings may have loosened a little bit on TV with reality TV and mm -hmm. um, things like that. I think that the the mores of the mm -hmm. people have changed a little bit. Would, would, certain things would be more acceptable, but other things definitely would not be. What did you do with the outtakes that you chopped uh, out? Most of the outtakes after I said I used to say I saw them, so I don't I don't care. <laughs> All right, so eventually you uh, went from that job to the studio crew. Studio crew, yes. And what'd you do there? I did cameras, lighting, stage managing, and once in a while was lucky enough to tell, give an idea, and they say follow it through. But basically, lighting because I was there to talk to somebody, but. Basically, lighting cameras, stage managing. It was a wonderful job. Yeah, but lighting, you know, a lot of people don't realize the importance of lighting. It's the most important. It's the only job you hope no one notices. Really? Because if you do a good job, that means everything looks the way it should look. It looks good, and uh, that's it. Were you one of those guys that spent a lot of time, you were real finicky in setting up those lights? Because I work with a couple of people like that. I, I like to think I was pretty... Fast. I, I, yeah. Number one, in television, they want you know you didn't get a lot of notice to do things. A lot of jobs were remotes outside, so you had to jury rig things. You're the, you, you never. Right. I don't think I ever went on anything where we had one hundred percent of everything we needed, so you had to think something up. Yeah. And uh, you always hope you have enough power to plug everything in. That's. But but lighting can literally change the way a person changes looks. the mood of everything. And not only a person, but a, a scene. Yeah, everything. It's, yeah. It's, to me, uh, if you can't see it, you can't enjoy it. Right. So what are some of the shows you worked on at Channel 6? Well, the old shows would be Step This Way, mm -hmm. uh, Anita Cleaver, The World Around Us, Sally Starr, Happy the Clown. Okay. Um, some of the news actors, I, I was thinking, I was going cleaning my computer up the other day, and I saw some pictures I had of like Larry Kane with Hubert Humphrey, mm -hmm. and um, we had Richard Nixon in one time. We brought in him studio? in the Sally Star. I don't have a picture. I wish I had a picture of that, but he was he was in doing a, 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 a some kind of documentary, and I and that was I had to take him to the door, and he saw the Sally Star show. He said, "What's that? Could I go in and see it?" He wasn't president at the time, mm -hmm. and I took him in, and he came on the Sally Star show. Then we, we left. Wow, you talk about, it's kind of a strange thing. Yeah, it was wonderful having these relationships with people that were, the, you saw them at their most human times. I mean, yeah. uh, Rich Nixon was you know, talk, talking to him and he was interested in what was going on. We had Joan Crawford in, we built her, we built her living room in our studios and, and then we, and, and she, she, she had a person, I'll never forget it, 
Um, all he did was light her cigarettes. Really? He just walked. He was in a nice yeah. blue suit. He just lit her cigarettes, and then we and yeah. then she came in on the. Um, we brought her into this on the Jerry Blavitt show. We used to do the Jerry Blavitt show, and she was taping at the same time. And she went. She walked up the ramp on the Blavitt show. I think she shook a little bit, but uh, wait a minute. She had a guy just light her cigarettes. So, at least that's all I ever. Now, saw that's him. what you call that's a star. all I ever saw him do. Where are the stars like that anymore? <laughs> She was I a, mean, that's what you call a star. <laughs> she was a real star. Yeah, of, um, of the, the old, in the old sense and let the me, new sense. I I'll guess. tell you something. She's the only one. We did the show, and everyone that worked on that crew got a handwritten note, thank wow. you note, with their name at the top of the thank you note, thanking you for what you did. Let me, let me I'm still not sure. What was she doing at Channel 6? I believe she came in, a, I believe, if I remember correctly, she was doing something, uh, Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola, I forget which company she was with, yeah. that uh, she was part of. Her right. husband was the uh, president, I think, of, oh, okay. and um, apparently um, the person that handled it was a man named Gene Vassell, mm -hmm. who was very famous in Channel 6 lore, Okay, and... Um, he, so he he brought her in. He he's the one that arranged it through 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 the uh, beverage company, the bottling company, I guess, in Philadelphia. Well, well, yeah. Well, she was she was part of that corporate setup, wasn't she? Wasn't she an owner? Well, I don't think she had anything. She didn't. Have, she was part of the uh, other uh, promote, yeah promotion. But, yeah, but she wasn't. Yeah, she was. She part didn't of own that. the piece of it, or anything. I think her husband did. Okay, so that was the connection. Yeah, and, so, and, and then that, how did she wound up with Blavitt? Jerry well, wasn't. he was taping in the other studio, okay. and of course, Jerry, being Jerry, he got her, he got her to come in to uh, do mm -hmm. make an appearance on the show. He didn't light her cigarette though. No, Jerry didn't. She, he, had, she already had a guy doing. She that. had a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I never. I can still see him every time, and, and he just be wherever it was. He just show up like Lurch. I guess. I guess the next question is what what she smoke. I don't. I don't remember that. It wasn't one. and I and I camels with no filters. And I don't. Know, and I don't know what she had for breakfast either. Okay. Sometimes. Okay. <laughs> now, what, what other? Now, now you had Richard Nixon uh, with uh, Sally Starr. We had and, and Joan Crawford with uh, uh, Jerry Blavitt. with Jerry Blavitt. Uh, well, any we, other strange pairings? We had. Well, Ed Hurst, though we we did his show. That 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 would you don't have enough time to talk about that show. Well, cut to the we, chase. The chase was it the, was. How, a, did, how did you get along with Ed? Got along fabulously with Ed. And so, so you couldn't, you couldn't, you could not get along. There's no way to have problems right. doing that show. It was nothing but fun. It was there a long were, day. It was uh, I, we taped I think three shows. Wow. And they were two hour shows, and um, I was. Telling Ed that one of the things one of the things I enjoyed number one he had great looking models on the oh, show oh, great looking wrong with models that. and and they were all very nice and and Sissy Sissy had everything organized right. uh, so you were dealing with two professionals right and really doing, dealing at Steel Pier and and at Steel Pier you never knew it was going to happen they had these we, we were setting up one time and I'm in the, early in the morning I'm walking past I hear this squeaking and I walk over it's a bunch of porpoises. Jumping up and down at a, at a tank, and I wa I walk over to look at them. Next thing you know, they were all jumping up and down in the oh tank. Oh my God! And the trainer says, "Please don't do that because you're not feeding them." And when I go to do my show, uh oh, uh, so they, you they won't want to perform. And they're not their union. They won't get paid. They're not going to be paid. <laughs> You were disrupting his whole act. Yeah. <laughs> so you you really had quite a quite a career. There. It was it was wonderful. The yeah. people I met, uh, Who Milton else? Burl, he wouldn't let us get away. He, he kept telling us about the old days in the studios. He was, had yeah. the whole crew around. Frank wow. Rizzo was always fun when he came. The big in the Bambino. Studio. Oh, he he always the first thing he did is make sure he'd see the crew. Yep. And tell tell a couple jokes, and, oh, yeah. and and he was to to everyone he was nice. Yeah. And, I, well, and I covered him for a while. Yeah, and so he I was, know what you're talking about. He, he was a great story. He was a great storyteller yeah. and a lot of fun. Henny Youngman right. uh, came in one time. So when we were done taping him, right, 
he wanted to go to lunch. Right. So we, he wanted to know where a good delicatessen was, and we told him, and we happened to be going to lunch. We asked him if he wanted to join us. So he said, sure. So we walk in the delicatessen with Henny Youngman. Oh, we didn't wow. get any service because the owner kept staring at oh, him. Oh, my. And laughing with him. And, where was of course, this? when the um, where Glassman's. Was... Glassman's. On, uh, behind... Um, by the hospital on, um, on I guess, Conchaca State Road. I okay, think that's, okay, uh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. He, he, Henny Youngman in a deli now. What, the, the, what, the, you know, yeah. how do you top that? Of course, well, of course, we paid the check for the entertainment <laughs> in the end. We picked, yeah, the the <laughs> owner charged us and we paid for it. I picked up, my buddy and I picked up the check. Did you try to give him jokes? No. no, we, no. Uh, you know, he a lot was, of the nice guys, was, was he on, though? Because some of those entertainers they were, are no, they're never not on, off. Uh, well, some he, are just, he was fine. Yeah. The one that was... He wasn't on. No, the, the guy that was never on, and if you ever interviewed him, you yeah. probably said the same, was Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis was serious when he came okay, in the studio. Okay, he wasn't on. Um, mm -hmm. We had guys from F Troop, the Forrest right. Tucker and Larry Storch. They were a riot. I think the Sonny Liston fight was going on, and we mm -hmm. had a satellite feed, so they didn't want to do the interview. They want to watch. We had a feed. Of what this is when satellites were in its early days, mm -hmm. but we, uh, they wanted to watch the feed from where, where I think it was the it may have been from the Manila feed. I'm not. Wow. I don't, I'm not sure, but yeah, it, they want to. They want to get done the interview real fast so they could sit and watch the feed, and then he was flying back to California. <laughs> uh, let's get technical. When, uh, when you started, what was it like? I mean, the cameras were those huge. When I started, when I went down to, uh, to the studios, we had. I, I, I let, let's let's back up a second. We yeah, went from um, I, I I was at 46th Street. I was in the business office. Then I went to the films, and then I went went in the studios in the new in the new building at the the round building. City line. City line. Right. When I went in there, and when I went in down to the studios, they had. Um, the RCA color cameras, the big ones, the, the TK42s, yeah. I think they were. They weighed about 300 oh. pounds a piece. They were huge. And the cable weighed a pound a foot. With the turret on the, they, the, the, we the lenses? We had the turret lenses. Yeah, yeah. And we did the RCA commercials in those days. Okay. And, and the big sin in those days was getting caught with a turret flip on the air. We, we, we'd go from the different lens sizes sure. for the different shots. Uh, we had to flip those lenses with no, maybe one. We didn't. Ha we didn't even use the zooms in the studio. Wow! And then in the other, that was in one studio. We had the color cameras. Mm. Then in the next studio, we had these GE automatic cameras in those mm. days. That mm -hmm. you theoretically you punched the button and the camera would get the shot. They were basically robotic. They didn't. Move, they didn't move in and out, dolly in or out. But they, but they, they did. They you could punch the shot up. And that was that's what was uh, another one that was crazy because the cameras never worked right from the day we moved in. They they would if if you put them on automatic, they would shake like this, wow. and you couldn't control them. And when you zoomed, you get noise or like lines through the viewfinder would create. Our, and they never so we had to keep them. We, and you couldn't lock them in, so we had to stand there and hold the camera. While we did shows like University of the Air, where mm -hmm. they were doing equals MC square and things like this, and it you was literally held the camera. It would literally held the cameras, and we had a we had one of the professor would come in, and he would give us a whistle to blow if he made a mistake. He'd make a mistake on purpose. It was the crew's job to blow a whistle. That's how he kept us awake. If he made a grammatical mistake or something like that, so th that was, was another, that boring. That, that that was primitive, but it worked, yeah. and it kept us awake. Then we had in the other studio, we had these old EMI cameras, black and white cameras. That's where we did Romper Room, mm -hmm. and we did Step This Way with Gretchen right. Wilder and right. Jimmy Sisko. And we did a lot of, uh, that was our big studio. Now, by the time you had left, I mean, what was what were things like? When I left, I left right before the robotic cameras came in. Okay. And some of the interesting things, you, you ask about the technical things. Mm -hmm. Um, lighting today is much different with the LEDs. You don't use as much power. The cable's right. a lot smaller. What took two hours to set up a simple remote uh, takes 10 minutes today. Wow. Um, even this interview that you're doing would have been cameras, the temperature in here would have been 20, 30 degrees hotter. 
uh, you know, feel the room any different. had to be, be careful about uh, sealing or burning something or something, or blowing, fuse. Or blowing, blow, blowing fuses. Uh, the cable for the cameras in those days, for the color cameras, weighed about a pound a foot. Can you imagine? Oh we went out God. and did baseball games. We did the we did the Mummers Parade in color and wow. dry golf remotes in color, dragging these heavy cables. Wow. All, uh, they, they come in 50 and 100 foot lengths, 25 foot lengths. And moving those 100 foot cables was, was a lot of work. So the cameras and the lighting have changed. Sound has changed also, too. Sound is, I, I'm not the next, I don't know, I work with I know, sound, that's not But your... I mean, sound was, uh, has changed tremendously and that it, that it picks up so many more things and, and well, it's, it's just everything's clearer. digital now. Yeah, and and much clearer, yeah. and um, and now now they're talking about 4K, where they go to a football game and one lens they can isolate, they can isolate players with one wide lens, so you don't even have need ca they, they don't even oh want a camera, and they they'll zoom into a play. So tech because of the clarity and the, and the uh, fidelity of everything. So what you're saying is there's been just a revolutionary change in technical stuff. It's revolutionary, but it's still, it's still entertainment. And the, the formula for making things good is still an effort, a good idea with good projection of that right. idea. And then the technology of presenting your idea is a lot easier to do. Well, not only that, you still have to have a good eye. Yes. You have to have the eye for the right. shot. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, it's similar to uh, writing. And, and it, it, nothing's really changed in the sense that good writing is good now and will always be good. Only the platforms have changed. That's, That's exactly essentially what right. you're saying. The pr to present your idea is, is clearer. Right. But, but the idea itself and the presentation of it is still the same. You and I, we both started... When film was that was the, that was the thing in television, right. and you really, in order to do a remote, you had to buy lines from the phone company. Correct. And if that was the only way you could really go live, or uh, to get from a remote location. Right. Uh, but that changed, of course, with uh, the TK seventy six. Well, everything everything's changed with 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 internet and how we transmit, how we receive everything. And um, but there, there's there's trade off too. If something goes wrong, it's harder to trace today because mm. everything's in in a little box. Where yeah. before there were tw several boxes. Yeah. So if this box didn't work, that other. box, yeah. you know, it led into something. But today it goes out on the internet. So did you work? You worked many a truck out there. I worked on many a remotes. Yeah. Um, climbed many a ladders. The lighting was. You had to get lit, these big, heavy lifts to get the lights. Uh, I mean, there's there's still a time and a place that we use those kind of lights, mm -hmm. the eight, the big HMIs, the mm -hmm. movie lighting, and there is a time and a place for that. Yeah. But it's much less uh, working in much smaller areas. Uh, the, the 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 way we transmit media, getting into where we used to look at film, and you had to wait for it to be developed yep. and, and all that. Now it comes in DVD or on a Bam. flash drive or... Well, as far as the reporters are concerned, we used to write our stories while it was in the soup. So that did, you know, now you had to do it really fast. Uh, did you ever have a problem with, with a, re, uh, a live shot and you stick the mast up and you had to be really careful about the wires? Did you uh, ever get involved with any of that? We, no, we. I mean, yeah, you, I was could, you could toast all, all, <laughs> every every remote. We we've always been concerned about that. Yeah. Years ago, there's a famous story of somebody driving the remote van in from an office, oh, one of those no. with the mast up, and forgot no. to put it down. Of course, it didn't make it to the station. No. With the mast down, but that that, that did happen once. People have been injured severely. Yeah, right? uh, people. That that's not a funny one, but no, no, people funny. have been injured. Um, fortunately, when this incident with the mast, nobody was injured except the mast. But um, yeah. uh, the 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 trucks today, they're not even trucks. They go out in little SUVs with the with yeah. a and the, and with the the small cameras, the GoPro cameras yeah, that mean, you can st stick anywhere or basically dial in, dial it and uh, set it up there and wait and and you. And people are Skype and things like that. Is yeah. uh, you watch the network, and which is the standard, and uh, 
you see Skype and you see uh, mm -hmm. stuff coming all the time with natural lighting. I, I'm not a fan of that, and I think quality suffers a yeah. little bit. Well, you're a lighting guy. Yeah, well, um, and uh, I also like, and I also like a good product, and I yeah. think the. In, in an effort to get some of these stores, if they could spend a little more time to make it look a little nicer, it is still coming in your living room. But the beauty part now is it's really become very democratic in the sense that you don't need all that expensive you equipment. No, you don't. You could literally have your own TV station. There's several. And? YouTube, I mean, I'm guilty I mean, too. I've uh, as a, just, a, just going out with the family I mean, and shooting stuff and putting it on YouTube. And yeah. So basically, it's really spread far and wide. Oh. It used to be a small, select group. It was a very select group. Now, uh, now you know, everybody's doing it. Um, I, think, I think it's great because you see so many more products. Right. Um, but I like, the, I, I like the idea of being able to go into a studio Right. have a nice idea about something and see it presented the way it should be presented. I want to get to your claim of your, your claim to fame. Uh -huh. Tell okay. me about what's your 15 minutes of fame. Tell us the story. I guess the 15 minutes of claim of fame would be uh, Frank Sinatra marrying Ava Gardner in my house. Where was your house? 506 West Springer Street. And that is in uh, Germantown? The, the West Mount Airy section Mount of Airy? Philadelphia, right off Lincoln Drive. How'd that come Drive. to be? The wedding was supposed to be at Ike Levy's house, which was at Henry Avenue and Schoolhouse Lane. Now tell people who Ike Levy was. Ike Levy and Leon Levy were, uh, I'm not sure of all the way it works out, were uh, Ike Levy was an owner of WCAU. So they were broadcasting yes, station and, owners. And, and, Le and Leon Levy, his brother, was married to Blanche Paley who was uh, part of C William, C S. William S. Paley and CBS, yes. Right, right. And um, the wedding was supposed to be at, at his house, and that house was not the houses that you see off Henry Avenue, but in the valley as you ride, come off the Henry Avenue Bridge, mm -hmm. there was a house, I, I believe it has burned down, but there was a, a big mansion with a Olympic-sized swimming pool and a gorgeous home, and the leave the wedding was going to be there. Okay. The night before the wedding, apparently, the way it was told to me is Frank didn't want all the reporters. The news had gotten out that the wedding was going to be at that house, and and Frank was worried about the all the reporters and everything else, and didn't want that publicity. Right. So my uncle Manny, who was a and my father, Manny but my, uh, my, yeah, Manny was a dear friend of Frank's and a very close right. associate. Uh, called my father up, right. and and my mother and asked, "How would you like to have the wedding at your house? They'll have the Ritz Carlton cater it. We don't have to do anything. Just allow them to use the house." How old were you? I was eleven years old. Okay, and my sister's. Uh, old, I don't want to give her age. She was. She you was better uh, not. <laughs> she's. She's all my older sister. She was there too. But and we all. We didn't know about. It. We went off to school. My father oh. the next morning, and I went off to school. Uh, the only thing I know is he told the school bus driver, "Make sure it brings me right home after school." Now I knew that the wedding was taking place at Levy's. Oh, and you I knew wanted, I heard about and, it. Yeah, and the reason I, and I wanted to go over and take a ride past the uh, house to see what the place looked like. Right. But uh, the bus Little driver told me. Little did you know it was going to happen in the, your place. And the bus driver told me, you got to get, I, I have orders to get you right home from school. Right. So when I get home. Uh, it was I, like afternoon, 2.30, yeah, 3 o'clock. Yeah, I get home around 2.30, 3 o'clock. And I, and I see this gentleman standing at the door that I've that I've met before he's a, was a Philadelphia detective mm -hmm. and he's standing at the door of the house and when he sees me he says you got to go in and get cleaned up they're waiting for you so when I came in they rushed me upstairs to get dressed and get all dressed up and of course at that point I find out there's all sorts of excitement going on in the house the, the, the caterers are there getting everything ready the dogs are feeding the one thing I did like and I'm 11 years old so I certain things I notice they're giving the dog a lot of lot of uh, champagne but that's that's okay, uh, okay. they shouldn't have done that but anyway uh, <laughs> 
dog. I got the, the, the next thing I know, uh, Frank and Ava are coming okay. to the house, and uh, the wedding starts, and when they walk outside a couple times, I don't know how they found out so fast, but the, the, the place was packed. So the reporters people, found out. The reporters found out. People found out. The hedges were being tr climbed over. Uh, people all over. I hear friends yelling my name, and I'm telling them I can't get them in the house. Oh, my. And it was a very, very exciting I, thing. And then as quickly as they showed up when it was over, off they, they left. And, and the, some of the guests that were at that was June Hutton was at the house. Mm -hmm. Ray Sinatra, who was a cousin of course, the Levies right. and uh, several that? other people. So who performed the ceremony? Uh, judge Sloan. Oh, so it was a judge of uh, Philadelphia right. judge. So, that's, that? That, so that, they, that's the story of it. Yeah. Did you uh, congratulate the bride and groom? Uh, yes. And, and, and she she is, uh, she is, uh, she was as gorgeous as in person as she was on film. I mean, she absolutely gorgeous. So it was a happy day. Yes, it was a wonderful occasion and a lot of fun. Well, it's hard to top that one. <laughs> it was, it so was, what do you do now, Steve? I just sit back and enjoy watching TV. Uh, once in a while, I still do a, a little things a little for Channel job. 6 and then and, and that's it. But you're, uh, you've had quite a career. Yep. As you look back on it, uh, you... I, I enjoy every minute of it. I, and uh, just a great time. Well, you're a real pioneer, that's for sure. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.